There is a visionary voice that emerges from every era. That's what jazz is, an ever-evolving composition of ideas bolstered by decades of cultural development, political toil, and, of course, innovative genius. The genre of modern jazz is able to distinguish itself from others in acknowledging with due respect its enormous musical past and still embracing the future of fluidity and change. So what is jazz? What's it made out of? I can give you my own personal definition that I like to live by. Improvisation based off of harmonic chordal progressions energized by the beats of syncopated rhythms. In other words, in simpler words, style, finesse, meticulously executed genius, and, perhaps most importantly, change. Modern music is defined by change. As old schools of thought die out, new ones emerge. As old rules are perpetually being vilified, newer, more quote-unquote radical ones are being proposed to take their place. Indeed, the scientific concept of dynamic equilibrium is perhaps best exemplified in the study of music theory, the continuous back and forth quest for what is orally acceptable in the era at hand. Of course, those acceptable sounds are subject to change. Do we all remember this? <laughs> um, a couple of years ago, the dress that seemed to break the internet divide families, turn brother against brother, or in my case, sister against sister. Well, don't laugh at me, I guess you already are, but I do think that this internet meme has a valuable lesson to teach us, one that is actually pertinent to the discussion at hand, and that is the value of perspective. Perspective. Um, <laughs> Even within, even within music, it's possible that you and I could hear the same exact chord, the same piece of music, the same Bach cantata, whatever, and yet you would go home and your brain would classify that as a completely different chord, spell it out as a completely different chord than my own brain would. It's, it's science, it's ego, it's personal preference, it's cultural background, I don't know, it's a lot of things. Um, to organize sound into a written representation, composers of all generations have some help. Music, musical nomenclature um, exists, and uh, it's supposed to help composers translate sound onto paper. Um, here are some of the many symbols that have been around for not just decades, but centuries of Western music. For example, that uh, SFZ in the corner is a dynamic symbol. It indicates, it means sforzando, it indicates a sudden change of volume, a sudden loudness. Um, and this little C with the cross through it, that's a meter symbol, so it's supposed to denote rhythmic, a rhythmic pattern of cut time. I mean, this is all well and good, and it looks very fancy and authoritative, but I'm here today to tell you that there are schools of modern day theorists rising up against this pre-existing doctrine, arguing that classical notation, terminology, and language is just not enough um, for the sounds of modern music, that it is too limiting, and that it indeed fails the sounds of modern day jazz. Um, Jacob Collier, here pictured in his famous cow shirt, um, is one of these quote unquote radicals uh, he's a British whiz kid and jazz extremist, as I like to think of him. Only 24 years old, he has certainly drilled a hole, or perhaps I should say drilled a truck through the existing sphere of um, musicologists. He composes, he arranges, he instrumentalizes, he vocalizes. My God, a couple years ago, I found myself wondering, is there anything this guy can't do? Apparently, it's act with a little bit of humility, but that's besides the point. Um, <laughs> yes, me personally, I do find him maybe a bit too brazen in his efforts, but I must concede that his arrogance is not misplaced. There is an element of genius in his uh, words and the ideas that he proposes, and I think we would do well to at least listen to some of the things he says. 
So let's get into one of his proposed fallacies of classical music theory. We are going to bring into question the quote-unquote hard and fast concept of major and minor sound. Now these two are concepts deep ingrained in the history of Western music. In effect, they are the broadest terms we can use to differentiate sound, which is a pretty big deal. And it might actually surprise you for me to tell you now that your ear and your brain, they're already acclimatized to these sounds. It's really simple. You hear music in a major tonality and your brain immediately thinks happy. Likewise, you hear something in a minor key and you are told to think sad. You don't, you don't have to be a postdoctorate studying Locrian mode or Lydian dominance in order to understand these two pretty basic concepts. Um, quick side note though, if anybody is interested in having a conversation on Lydian or Locrian, I will be free after the event, and I would love, 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 love to have one of those discussions. But my point, the point I'm trying to make is that you don't have to bother yourself with such big, fancy schmancy words in order, in order to understand what I would call innate concepts, major and minor. They were written into existence over 300 years ago. Quick shout out to the OG theorist, Johann Sebastian Bach. But, 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 but. Do they clearly um, demonstrate two completely disparate ideas of sound? Are they distinct enough to support an expansive realm of, at this point, not only music but culture as well? Do they serve their purpose perfectly or just well enough? Well, let's get into that. <laughs> Um, so for the sake of clear comprehension today, we're going to be juxtaposing two um, pretty simple chords that are used often interchangeably in the study of jazz. Um, a minor 7, which is a fundamentally minor chord, and C major 6, which is a fundamentally major chord. Um, yes, and we're actually going to spell out these chords together, me out loud, and you can just do it in your heads, but I'm sure you'll be able to follow along. So what I like to do is I like to think of A, so we're going to start with A minor 7 chord, sorry. And the first letter tells us what the root of the chord is. The root, I like to think of it as the sun in the heliocentric system that is the overall chord, which itself is located in the, in the greater galaxy of the entire musical piece. Put in terms of this analogy, the root seems to be rather significant, yes? Well, I'll tell you, yes, it's pretty important. Um, okay, so let's start building the chord, and I'm going to just play it a little bit so you'll be able to hear. Um, so A minor 7, we know that our root is going to be A. We've all seen the sound of music. We know do a deer, a female deer. That's exactly what this is. And A is going to be our root, our do. And now, if you would be so kind as to indulge in, 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 in my question, we're going to start with A and count every other letter after that as our chord tones. So you have A, we're going to skip B, take C, and skip D, take E, and just for fun, we'll throw on a seventh on top of that, go F, G. So we have our comprehensive A minor seven chord, A, C, E, G. Sounds pretty melancholy, right? Mopey even? If you're not convinced, let me play you a little something. Okay, A minor 7, mopey, sad, comical, whatever you want to call it. Let's talk about the other chord I said we'd be bringing into question, the C chord, the fundamentally major chord. C major 6, we're going to build it the same way we built the other one. This time we know the solar system is going to be revolving around C. Right, so we start on C, every other letter. C, D, E, F, G. Just for fun, believe me, we're just going to add an A on top of that as a major 6. And hopefully you all recognize this brilliant piece of classical classical music I'm going to play for you. <laughs> Wonderful. 
fundamentally, twinkle, twinkle, little star, I would hope, evokes a sense of happiness and of major tonality, right, to your brains. If there are alarm bells going off in your heads right now, you're following along my argument brilliantly. If not, let's actually break it down step by step. There is a certain discord between the two statements I just said, right? On one hand, the two sounds I just played for you, they sounded completely different, right? The first, the little comic jingle, and then Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. We have mopey, melancholy, we have happy, I don't know, what other words have happy? I mean, you know, it's Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, we grew up with this nursery rhyme. We, our parents wouldn't sing us something to sleep if it, if it had a minor tonality to it, right? I would hope. Um, so while that may be true, you can see on the screen, and we just built these two chords together, that they are composed of a grand total of four of the same chord tones, right? A, C, E, G, C, E, G, A, whatever order you want to arrange them in, you've got to admit that they are the same four notes. That poses a bit of a problem. So, how do we resolve this bit of a problem? Um, sorry. <laughs> like I said before, like I said before, the rules are subject to change, right? I mean, technically, if we, if we follow classical doctrine, those two chords, that fundamentally minor chord and that fundamentally major chord, they should exemplify the most intense divergence even possible in all of Western music. And maybe they do, right? Maybe they do, but maybe on paper, if we really think it out, they don't. As expected, this school of thought, um, this school of thought has garnered an equally strong response from classicists who uh, stand by pre-existing classical doctrine and condemn any other new ideas as radical. For my part, I couldn't tell you which side of the argument is better, and that's not my intention tonight. However, I do want to just remind you that perspective exists. It's a real thing. And like I said before, change is invaluable, and change is inevitably, and maybe paradoxically, what will end up tying all generations of music together. And just to end on a very clean note, in case you were wondering, the dress from before is blue and black. Thank you. <laughs>